rimanere nei tempi mi raccomando e, perché siete tutti online quindi diciamo è più difficile controllarvi ma vi spegniamo tutto quanto e non ci siamo. allora il primo speaker del pomeriggio è eh, Giovanna Bonfanti che eh, ci presenta una ricerca ah, sorry, in English uh, <coughs> sorry but after the, the lunch uh, some conviviali You didn't uh, drink the wine. Okay, without wine anyway. Um, with the joint research with Elena Bonetti and Riccardo Rossi, and the title of the talk is an local model for adhesive contact. Um, please, uh, Giovanna, you can start. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the organizers for this uh, kind invitation. This is a... This is a very nice opportunity for me. So today, today uh, I will do, just a moment, please. No. Okay, so uh, today I will uh, present you um, a, a short review about uh, um, contact problem with adhesion starting from an original model uh, proposed by Michel Fremont and uh, uh, adding step by step some other ingredients uh, in, order to, um, in order to get a description of the real phenomenon um, as complete uh, as possible. I start, uh, in fact, uh, um, underlying some applications. I have to say that Uh, adhesive contact problems uh, um, play an important role uh, in uh, the analysis of the stability uh, of the stability of uh, uh, composite structures uh, of layer structures um, and it is well known that such kind of materials are more and more used in the industry and in the building and the civil engineering In fact, uh, the uh, interface uh, um, regions between uh, laminates uh, affect the stability of the whole structure. And uh, um, the separation on, of uh, um, bonded laminates uh, due to the degradation of the, uh, of the glue of the adhesive substance may lead to uh, the material failure. So it is uh, uh, important to characterize the behavior of uh, uh, such kind of uh, uh, laminated materials. And uh, uh, as uh, the degradation is a phenomenon um, that uh, um, takes place on a surface, on the, the surface of contact, it is uh, uh, quite natural from the analytical, from the mathematical point of view, Uh, resort to um, surface damage models. In fact, we, um, uh, we, we resort to a modeling approach proposed by uh, Fremond, a surface damage theory, a surface damage approach, uh, leading to uh, efficient and uh, predictive theories for the mechanical uh, behavior of the whole structure. The model. Um, the model is the following. We are considering uh, a viscoelastic uh, body, which is located in a uh, bounded domain omega of R3. And uh, uh, we suppose that it may become in contact with adhesion with the rigid support. With, with the rigid support on a prescribed part gamma C of uh, its boundary. So we can see the picture. Imagine that on gamma C, uh, that gamma C is covered by glue. Uh, on the other parts of the uh, boundary, gamma 1 and gamma 2, some uh, displacement and uh, some attraction um, are assigned. 
Actually, um, the, um, a more complete, uh, um, a more complete description on uh, this uh, problem uh, consider two bodies, uh, two bodies uh, um, glued together along uh, a, a common part of the boundary. But since uh, uh, nothing changes from the analytical point of view, from the modeling point of view, I uh, prefer to, um, to reduce uh, um, our study to the previous situation the previous situation uh, when we are considering a single body in order to simplify uh, the notation in order to simplify uh, the, um, the presentation so we come back to the previous uh, uh, picture and then uh, in our modeling approach uh, we have to uh, describe essentially two facts the first one the unilateral contact um, expressed by signorini like conditions between the body and the subword. And the other fact, the other characterizing fact, the adhesion phenomenon. Um, and in particular, um, we have to characterize and the modeling the behavior of the glue between the body and the subword. As uh, I said before, we um, resort to uh, a surface damage theory. That is, as we will see in a moment, we will derive the equations for the uh, ruling the evolution of the, um, the parameter describing the behavior of the glue directly uh, on the surface, directly by energy and dissipation uh, defined on the contour surface, concentrating on the contour surface. This is uh, um, in fact, a surface damage theory. Of course, other approaches are, um, are possible in, in, to describe such kind of problems, as we will see at the end of my presentation. Uh, the idea in these alternative approaches is to consider the behavior uh, on the interface as limit, as limit of the behavior of some think medium, which links the body uh, and the support to two bodies. So the idea is to derive damage, uh, surface damage model as limit of volume damage model. But I uh, come back on this topic at the end of my presentation. Now, in this approach, uh, the, uh, as the, um, you see here, uh, in this approach, the state variable are defined in the bulk domain and on the contact surface. So uh, the variable defined on the contact, uh, on the, the volume domain, on the bulk domain is uh, epsilon of u, the state variable of the, of the model, where u denotes the displacement, the small displacement. In, the fact, in fact, we are working under small perturbation assumption. And uh, epsilon of u uh, denotes the uh, symmetric linearized stress state. Conversely, on the contour surface, uh, we, are assuming, we are assuming that um, there's a, a variable, a variable key, which is scalar, with, uh, that is a, a, an addition parameter. It is a, a, a phase parameter, in fact. In the sense, it uh, represents a proportion, a fraction of active bonds between the body and the support, as we will see better uh, um, later. We assume also its gradient uh, as a state variable and uh, the trace of the displacement, the trace of the displacement on gamma C in order to take into account local interaction between the adhesive and the support by U, and uh, uh, in the adhesive itself by the gradient of key. And now we uh, refer to uh, Fremont modeling approach. That is, uh, we uh, derive the equations for U and key uh, from the principal principle of virtual powers, uh, in which also the power of microscopic forces are included. This is the new part. Um, in fact, uh, the adhesion is a typical phenomenon where 
microscopic forces, microscopic movement give rise to macroscopic effects. So we have to take into account also the power of such microscopic forces in the balance. And uh, uh, we can, in this way, um, derive uh, two equations. The, uh, the first one is a classical, is uh, the momentum uh, balance equation for uh, uh, the macroscopic uh, displacement U. Uh, if you neglect uh, any uh, acceleration forces, uh, the equation is uh, classical, is a minus divergence of uh, um, minus divergence of sigma, the stress tensor e equal to some body force F, supplemented by suitable boundary conditions. And the new part of the model is uh, the, second, the second equation, which is in fact a balance equation for microscopic movements. Uh, it is an equation uh, defined on, uh, on gamma C, and this has, this has uh, um, such expression. I skip here, uh, in fact, uh, any details, any details, and uh, I just, I, I say this fact, uh, the involved quantities, that is uh, R, sigma, B, and uh, H, uh, as uh, to be defined, uh, as uh, to be defined uh, um, by, sorry, as to be defined by um, constitutive relations, okay, okay, by constitutive relations uh, given in terms uh, of uh, volume and the surface energy and the dissipation functional. I skip uh, completely uh, this, uh, this part. I say just uh, um, you that uh, this volume and surface, um, this energy and the dissipation function as in fact defined um, both in the volume and uh, on the contour surface. So we split these uh, um, different contributions. Again, uh, in uh, energy the dissipation potentials enforce the physical, the physical constraint on the variables in order to ensure physical consistency. They typically contain uh, indicator functions, so they hold, uh, they, they hold plus infinity for uh, non Admissible values of the variable. As a consequence, as we will see in a moment, um, subdifferential of such indicator functions, so multivalued operators, uh, will appear in the equation. Let me precise the adhesion phenomenon. Uh, I introduce some classical notation. Uh, the uh, normal and uh, tangential component of uh, some uh, vector u uh, or sigma n. And uh, uh, I'm, what is the, the, the meaning of key and uh, um, what is the, uh, the constraint on this variable? So key denotes the, is the surface damage parameter and denotes exactly the proportion, the fraction of active glue fibers at each point on the contour surface. Key is uh, between zero and one uh, in the sense, uh, in, in this sense, key equal to zero means no adhesion, so completely broken bonds. On the contrary, key equal to one means complete adhesion, so unbroken, undamaged bonds. And the key between zero and one stands for intermediate situation. So the, for, the, the, the first constraint that we have to impose into the model is uh, this one. We impose this constraint by this indicator function, the indicator function on the interval 0, 1, which appears here. This is uh, the uh, expression for the surface energy function. There are many terms. I um, underline this rendering the constraint on the variable. As a consequence, as we will see, uh, it's a sub-differential, the sub-differential of such indicator function will appear in the equation for key. 
and uh, this is this graph. We aim actually uh, to impose another constraint in this sense. If we aim to describe in a reversible uh, process, in a reversible evolution for the damage, uh, we have, of course, uh, to uh, impose uh, some constraint on the time, on the sign, on the time derivative of key. And um, in order to render so the irreversible character of the degradation process, we have to enforce that uh, key dot um, is non-positive. We uh, render this constraint by this indicator function indicator function on the offline. As a consequence, uh, its sub-differential, as we see in a moment, will appear in the flow rule in the um, evolution equation for key. So the uh, evolution uh, equation for the adhesion on uh, the contour surface is exactly this one. As uh, we uh, can see, uh, it's uh, um, in fact uh, a differential inclusion um, due to the presence of a multi-valued operator rendering the constraint on the variable and on its time derivative. And it is of parabolic type. On the right hand side, um, we have a competition between two terms which have opposite sign. Uh, omega is positive. Uh, we may think for simplicity to a constant and it uh, represents some internal cohesion of the material. On the contrary, on the, contrary the other one is negative and uh, it uh, uh, plays the role, uh, it represents a source of damage, a source of damage due to the displacement. Now, the other, uh, the other aspect, the unilateral contact, how to impose, how to describe the unilateral contact between the body and the sound. First of all, we have to impose an impenetrability condition. So we have to uh, impose that the normal component of the displacement uh, is non positive. If u n is equal to zero, we have contact. Is if it is less than zero, we lose contact. Again, we have to render the signorini conditions. We are uh, related to the normal to the normal reaction. The signorini condition, in fact, in this case. Uh, uh, with the contact with adhesion are exactly um, described by this expression of uh, the normal reaction. The normal reaction is uh, minus QN minus an element in uh, this uh, subdifferential, which uh, uh, forces uh, this uh, constraint on UN. You can and uh, uh, rephrased, in fact, uh, this expression, the previous one, in terms uh, of inequalities. And uh, recover, in fact, uh, the uh, signorini conditions uh, in the case uh, where the adhesion is present. If key is equal to zero, so no adhesion, these uh, uh, relations uh, reduce exactly to the classical signorini conditions linking uh, um, normal displacements and normal reaction. But uh, if the adhesion is active, uh, there's a new fact uh, due to the presence of the glue, in fact. If uh, the adhesion is active, uh, by this expression, by the expression for sigma n, we deduce this fact. If uh, you are losing contact, if, if u n is less than zero, this term is uh, zero, and uh, sigma n has this expression, it is positive. So it, is, uh, it has an opposite sign to the, um, with respect to the situation without addition. 
What is the meaning? The meaning is this is if you try to separate the body to the support, there's a reaction which counteracts this separation. And this is, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the action, the efforts of the group. Okay, um, we need, uh, um, again, a momentum balance in order to, uh, to complete uh, the, the, the system. So the momentum balance, uh, as uh, I said before, uh, is uh, classic, and uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is one in a linear um, viscoelasticity supplemented by boundary conditions. Uh, Dirichlet-Neumann boundary condition and the expression of the reaction, normal and tangential component. In order to uh, study, um, in order to analyze uh, uh, this system, we uh, aim to introduce some variational formulation. And uh, um, I summarize here the, uh, the equation. The equation for key uh, will be satisfied pointwise, and uh, the equation for you will be satisfied in a variational, in a variational form. Here it appears uh, um, an auxiliary variables uh, useful in order to um, handle this uh, uh, subdifferential uh, operator. I just uh, um, underline the analytical difficulties uh, um, which are connected to the study of the system. Um, here we have the double multivalue constraint, constraint on the solution and on its derivative. And this is, of course, a trouble from the point of view, uh, from the analytical point of view. And also this coupling um, by these uh, quadratic terms, uh, which are on the boundary. But we can uh, overcome uh, all of these uh, difficulties and uh, we, can, we can prove that uh, this system, this problem, uh, admit, admit a solution. Now I, am, I aim to uh, generalize, um, I, I would like to generalize uh, the previous model, taking into account other aspects. The first one, the friction, friction effects on the contour surface. And the, moreover, some non-local uh, source of damage on the contour surface. And finally, also thermal effects, possibly um, both in the bulk domain and uh, on the contour surface. We proceed step by step. The first point is how to, how to include, how to encompass into the model friction. Uh, we uh, essentially use the Coulomb law for friction. So uh, the tangential component of uh, uh, the reaction is uh, modified in this sense. This was the previous expression, essentially. And uh, we have to add another term accounted for friction. Mu is uh, the friction coefficient. This uh, quantity is, uh, um, this D is, uh, a maximal uh, monotone uh, operator of this type. We mm, can to simplify uh, think uh, to, to, to sign operator. This is uh, um, a, an equivalent way to uh, write, uh, in fact, uh, the Coulomb law, the Coulomb law for friction um, accounting of, of course, uh, uh, for addition. I just, uh, um, underline uh, um, a crucial uh, point from the analytical point of view. From the analytical point of view, the problem is uh, exactly here. In the sense that uh, this quantity, um, which can uh, uh, read here, is uh, an element uh, in uh, a subdifferential. So uh, we have here a product between two multivalued operators. And this fact, uh, um, is a, a, a very hard um, okay. analytical difficulty. Okay. Sì? You have uh, five minutes to 
question in included. So, I mean, uh, that's half an hour, question included. So, um, it's a three. We started at uh, five, so you have five minutes. Uh, sorry, sorry, Roberto, I cannot understand why. Uh, I am again. Now, now four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Just four minutes. Yeah. Okay. It's half an hour question and also included. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Uh, so, um, okay, so we can, uh, um, okay, I skip, I will skip something, okay. Um, this is uh, the, um, this is the model, this is the model where, uh, um, which uh, takes into account uh, also, also the function, okay? And uh, also for this kind of a problem, we can uh, obtain a result. So uh, two words about uh, a new contribution in the sense that uh, we consider here a non-local model for uh, adhesive contact. Um, and the motivation, in fact, uh, come, uh, comes from experiments. Um, okay, come from experiments. In, in fact, uh, this paper due to Freddy and Fremont uh, show that the elongation, that is the variation of the distance between the two distinct points on the contact surface may have damaging effects. So in order to take into account a fact like this, uh, we have to introduce into the model a non-local non quantity. And uh, as a consequent integral terms will appear in the flow rule and uh, in the normal reaction. Um, coming back to the previous configuration with two bodies, uh, I have to say that uh, we can uh, consider um, we can uh, add, in fact, a new contribution due to uh, non-local uh, source of damage, uh, which can see, uh, in fact, uh, here with, uh, it appears the displacements of uh, um, the difference of the displacement in two different points on the contact surface. Coming back for simplicity uh, to the previous situation uh, with a single body, um, we see that the previous, uh, the previous uh, equation where just the local source of, of damage uh, is uh, considered is uh, here completed by another term accounting for uh, non-local damaging, uh, non-local damaging. Okay, um, this uh, term in effect uh, contains uh, the new variable just introduced, modulated by this part, uh, which renders the attenuation of non-local action with distance between the two points uh, on the contact surface. Uh, this, is the complete, uh, this is the complete system um, where uh, uh, by a suitable integral operator, we can take into account uh, the uh, non-local source of damage on the contact surface here and uh, a couple term uh, in the normal reaction. I don't say um, anything about the thermal effects. Um, is it possible to include them in the model, but I skip uh, I skip uh, this, uh, uh, this part, okay? I skip uh, for the generalization that are possible, coupling, in fact, uh, all these effects, friction, thermal effects, and also non-local effects. I conclude, this is the last uh, slide. I conclude uh, hinting to uh, an alternative approach uh, in order to describe uh, such kind uh, um, such kind of of, of, pro, of, of models of progress. Um, the idea is uh, to recover the behavior on the interface uh, as a limit of the behavior of the uh, fin medium, which links uh, the body and the support or the, the two bodies. So the idea is to justify um, the um, surface damage model as a, a limit from, from volume uh, damage models via uh, dimensional reduction. There's results in some sense 
and uh, uh, there's also results, uh, uh, this last results uh, um, perform uh, just this uh, passage to the limit in a formal way. And uh, we hope uh, to, uh, to justify completely this uh, formal uh, asymptotic expansion, uh, expansion method. We hope to justify completely this, uh, patch, this uh, patch, passage to the limit uh, via uh, gamma convergence or uh, uh, variational technique. Okay, uh, I stop here. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you to you. Thank you. Um, okay, we have time for one question, short question. Please, come here. Very short. Hi, Giovanna, thank you for the nice uh, talk. Uh, you spoke about uh, quasi static models. Uh, yeah. My question is uh, what about uh, dynamic? Yeah. Uh, okay. The problem of uh, uh, insert uh, acceleration is very, very difficult, uh, as uh, you know um, very well, um, because uh, uh, the coupling between uh, dynamics and uh, unilateral uh, constraint is very treat from the analytical point of view. Uh, it's very difficult to treat from an analytical point of view. There are, uh, anyway, some, uh, some hope uh, in the sense uh, there are some, uh, um, some, uh, some works, uh, some, just a paper uh, due to Giulio, Giulio and uh, Giulio Schimperna and uh, other, uh, other people, you know, um, uh, where uh, the coupling between uh, dynamics and uh, unilateral contact is performed. So the idea is uh, to, uh, to, to consider such kind of technique in order to apply um, and uh, apply this technique and in order to uh, obtain some result also in this uh, situation, which is, of course, uh, more complicated. Okay, so I, are you working uh, on it? Okay, okay. Uh, okay I, I got good, <laughs> very good. Uh, we are also uh, working about this uh, and um, okay so it's, uh, it's a, a good thing um, a good thing uh, um, change information and uh, and, uh, and ideas of course okay okay thank you okay thank you okay so thank you again and uh, next speaker is uh, Asunta Marrocchi Asunta Aida Asunta. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe you can uh, share your yes. Here it is. Okay. Should oh. work. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, yes, okay. yes. I can see and hear you. Okay. Uh, so the talk will be about sustainability and cell damage control in built heritage. Crystallization in inhibitors made simpler via mathematical modeling and statistics. So we have, so I precise it, 25 minutes of plus questions, okay? Okay. <laughs> thank you, Roberto, and thank you all the organizers for uh, the kind invitation. Uh, I will go directly into the, the, the problem that is salt crystallization damage, which is recognized as uh, one of the major causes of the PD material degradation. Is, and it is particularly relevant in historical buildings and archeological sites. Uh, salt is present typically inside building stone as free ions. Uh, let's talk about chloride, nitrate, sulfate, and so on. And it can be a natural element uh, of the material. And uh, it can be created, for example, by, by reaction with pollutants uh, or introduced by water solution into the porous matrix by different processes. And the most uh, 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 important, let's say, of this process is undoubtedly the rising dam. And uh, this is also the most difficult to remove when dealing with uh, old buildings, actually. So let's consider the initially uh, 
a, 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 a dry storm like the one you can see here in the in the in this sorry in this uh, in this picture and uh, it is wetted by a salt solution right here for example and during the wetting phase what happens is that water fills up the stone bringing the this salt the soil present in the outside environment. And if the stone is in contact with the ambient air, then it happens that water molecules are exchanged uh, with the environment by evaporation. Thus, in this way, it starts the drying phase. And the rate of drying, of course, depends on several factors, including the relative humidity. At this point, the soil content in the water fraction of the, of the, of the stone um, starts to uh, concentrate and the solution becomes supersaturated. Once a high degree of supersaturation is reached, salt starts crystallizing. And then we have here two um, different situations. In the first case, salts crystallize within the porous network. And so we talk about subfluorescence. And crystallization takes place on the exterior boundaries of the stone. In this case, we call uh, it efflorescence. The uh, disruptive uh, phenomenon is one which is associated with subfluorescence because uh, let's say that the crystal, the, this causes, uh, this implies the, the, the formation of large crystals inside the pores and the pressure of these crystals exerted on the pores, uh, on the walls of the pores can uh, overcome the tensile strength of the porous matrix and can lead to a widespread cracking and loss of surface as you can see in the picture here. And the, uh, let's say the occurrence of this efflorescence uh, or subfluorescence, which of course more than the other, it depends from, uh, on several factors, including of course soil type, concentration of salt, microclimate, evaporation rates, substrate porosity characteristics, and so on. Um, one way to prevent the uh, crystallization, uh, let's say, inside the pore, and therefore the stone breakage, is the, uh, to treat the porous material uh, with a substance that inhibits subfluorescence uh, in favor of efflorescence. These crystallization inhibitors indeed reduce the pressure associated with the uh, growing crystal, trying to keep it below the breakage point. And uh, the additives typically uh, also in bulk, not really only in uh, uh, porous materials, are known to alter the surface properties of the crystals, which led, you can see, oops, we, you can see here, to the uh, formation, uh, um, to, to modification on the crystal nucleation growth and thereby uh, changes in the sites and in the shape of the crystal and in their agglomeration or dispersion behavior. And uh, when translate this uh, into porous material, this means experiments, uh, let's say, shows that uh, uh, binucleation prevention or crystal habit modification, the inhibitors may increase efflorescence, uh, as was uh, previously mentioned, well, um, uh, let's say, uh, versus uh, subfluorescence. And the effect of inhibitors depend from uh, several, uh, let's say, uh, factors here again. That is, again, salt type or structural properties of the substrate and depends on the application methodology. Uh, on the other hand, we can say that the uh, 
adding a, a, a crystallization inhibitor uh, on a porous stone does not affect the transport properties of the, of the material. Here we can see, for example, um, let's say a, 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 the effect of the treatment of a brick sample uh, with an inhibitor formulation developed by our group and about which I will tell you uh, in a minute. You can say here how the presence of the inhibitors on the left, you have the untreated sample, on the right, you have the treated one, change dramatically the crystal morphology and um, most importantly, the crystal size. So let's um, come to the, our uh, work uh, uh, straightforward and we say that in recent years we have undertaken a broad research focusing on the inhibition properties of a pool of biobased molecules which are soluble in water or alcohol, are non-toxic and are active at very low concentration. Indeed, uh, this pool of molecules, uh, within this pool of molecules, we identify a, a one a, in particular, which is the one you can see represented here, it is the phosphositrate, which is um, uh, very effective. I wouldn't go into the rationale of the choice of this. Uh, uh, inhibitor in thermal structures, I will say to you that uh, this inhibitor um, showed a, a, a good uh, property, a good, a good action, a good efficiency from a, a, a several different sources. You can see at least here and binary, binary and ternary mixtures of the source. Mm -hmm and then on a variety of substrates, mm -hmm. and also some case studies were carried out, which nicely supported the, the laboratory results. Here you can see, um, let's say one example of how uh, the experiments are uh, carried out, which is uh, uh, actually functional to, to what I'm going to, to tell you uh, just after this, that is uh, uh, an example of uh, a brick and sodium sulfate system. Let's say the salt is sodium sulfate and the, in water, of course, and the brick is the reference material. Uh, so uh, sodium sulfate is considered one of the most harmful uh, um, salts in uh, the degradation of the building material because it can easily uh, supersaturate as uh, a solubility which is highly temperature dependent and uh, results in significant volumetric changes uh, uh, by hydration or crystallization. So it is very destructive uh, salt. And here you can see the, the, the setup of the experiment. Um, we use the um, a sealed, uh, let's say, uh, uh, so the, 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 the flow of the solution is forced to go through the, uh, only through the, 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 the slab, whatever, and um, let's say that uh, the weight loss, we, we plotted the, the weight loss uh, uh, by water evaporation per unit of exposed surface area at different time intervals. And so, uh, and then we plot, uh, here it is the results of the plot. You can see here the first, uh, the, the first part of this plot and here you have the untreated material here and here you have the treated material. You can see the very low concentration. The concentration goes to one, from one to 100 ppm at the maximum. And you see that uh, the presence uh, therefore of this phosphocytrate uh, uh, improved the flux of the uh, saline solution through the porous material. That is the inhibitor helps the crystallization to occur on the uh, surface of the material and not within the pore. And here you can see a demonstration of 
this. Here it is the untreated samples, and here you can see the treated sample. These last two are picture I already showed you uh, a while ago, actually. Well, let's say that um, we can say that macroscopically the efficiency, uh, efficiency of, the, of uh, inhibitor uh, on salt crystallization translates into an increase of the solution transport uh, that is uh, a lower harmfulness uh, for the porous matrix, but uh, the use of these inhibitors is still controversial since it is not completely clear how they work in a porous material. And this is where the collaboration with Roberto, Gabriella, and Maurizio started on this topic. Indeed, a study to, has been carried out to describe mathematically the effect of phosphocytrate on sodium sulfate crystallization. Uh, of course, inside a brick porous matrix. Just to start, it was the most investigated topic uh, of us at that time. Well, uh, here is the transport model used. Uh, I'm not going very much into details because I'm a chemist by training, so I just couldn't go into details, but I will try to go uh, to, to highlight some key points, let's say. The transport model. Uh, in the transport model, the first equation is uh, obtained uh, from the, let's say, mass balance equation for the water fraction. And here we define N0 as the porosity of the amplitude of material. N is the porosity of the material. And uh, the first term of this equation is, um, let's say, the, takes into account the water flux into the matrix that is uh, described by Darcy Law. And this uh, term here is uh, um, the, uh, the evaporation rate inside the matrix. As to the second equation, uh, this is introduced as an equation for the crystal growth, where uh, CI here is the uh, actually you can say is the concentration of free ions of salt in the in the sample. This is the um, sorry, this is the, 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 the super saturation concentration, the super saturation level, let's say, and then we have this KS, which uh, we will see in, in, in short, it is very important. Uh, parameter to describe the behavior of the inhibitor, which is it takes into account the rate of completion. Then we have the, this third equation, which takes into account the um, con concentration of salt crystals that are formed, and why gamma represents the specific uh, volume of a single uh, uh, sulfate crystal, crystal of sodium sulfate. And uh, uh, then we have, and this means it takes into account the uh, crystal habit modification. And the last uh, equation uh, is the mass balance uh, equation for the salt, which is the salt uh, in water, where T is the salt diffusion coefficient and uh, uh, this term at the very right side is a sink term that takes into account uh, the crystal formation into the uh, porous matrix. Um, well, uh, in this table I reported the, 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 the known parameters and uh, since uh, some of the known parameters, uh, but uh, some of them were not known. So what was done was to fix the model versus the experimental data and the obtained value were expected, of course, to, to give some insight into the action of the inhibitors uh, in the crystallization process. Uh, here in the second table, you can see uh, some of the coefficient uh, to be determined, and uh, we shall see that uh, here the two highlighted in yellow 
uh, are crucial for the appropriate description of the, of the inhibitor indeed. But uh, now, the uh, first step was to calibrate the model with the uh, pure water transport. I wouldn't go into the detail of the experimental setup. You can see a representation here. Um, let's say that the experiments were uh, carried out in according to international standard to determine the water absorption coefficient by capillarity and the drying parameters of the material. So it serves, uh, they, they serve as control sample to test the transport property of the material under study. And uh, here is the uh, model because uh, we are in absence of salt, so it simplifies uh, dramatically, let's say. And for each experiment, uh, we um, fixed, uh, were fixed the initial and boundary condition here in red and to apply to the transport model. Again, I will not go into the detail of this. I would only say that we separately uh, treated the inhibition phase and the drying phase to get rid of the otherwise uh, severe condition required by the CFL convergence condition uh, in the latter case, let's say. The problem has been solved and this um, using a finite difference numerical method and uh, actually the parameters for both the phase of inhibition and the uh, drying were determined. And here you can see the error is about 7%. And in this other uh, part of the slide, we, you can see the, the um, plot of the, um, uh, the comparison, which uh, shows the comparison between the measured data and the numerical data simulation after, uh, after fitting. Uh, this is the uh, model for the, uh, how the model becomes for the water sodium sulfate transport, uh, of course. And here are the, 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 the equations reported. Again, um, the, uh, were treated the setup represented here to, to, to measure the distribution of salts. We break the uh, slabs in four pieces, more or less of the same dimension, and then they were uh, reconstructed, resealed again uh, to, 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 uh, to, to, to force the, the capillary rise, of course. Here is the conditions, uh, boundary condition for the inhibition phase and the evaporation phase. And of course, uh, um, for the, as you can see here, for the dry phase, uh, for the setup I just mentioned to you, uh, we consider separately the four bricks composing uh, the slab and each uh, broken uh, brick is uh, indicated with the I here. Let's say, and uh, let's go directly to the um, results. And uh, you will see here that these are the, 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 the plots of the profile of the quantities which are obtained uh, numerically at the end, let's say, of the inhibition experiments. And uh, it lasted uh, 47 days. For the non-treated bricks, of course, here we are talking about first the non-treated bricks. And uh, a note here, the, as expected, the quantity of water here is uh, um, a decreasing function of the height of the sample because, uh, of course, uh, uh, the top of brick uh, you saw in the setup is, is uh, in contact with ambient air, so it is uh, uh, interested by water exchanges with, uh, with the exterior. And then we have in this other case, the graphs of the same quantities, uh, but for the drying phase. And uh, again, here we can, uh, we can uh, if we look at the, here at the, um, 
uh, amount of salt, uh, we as expected see that it is an increasing function of the age of the brick because uh, crystals mostly form where the quantity of water is, is, uh, is less, is lower. Uh, finally, Uh, the, the, um, with the, um, let's say, uh, water sodium sulfate solution, but uh, in the presence of treatment with, uh, with the inhibitor. And you can see here an interesting information. And the interesting information is that uh, in the case of the treatment, which is this PC124, um, let's say that uh, the uh, quantity of salt increase hmm, at, with the eight of the of the specimen uh, because the, the it is uh, the, 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 the precipitation rate is uh, faster and you can see also here by comparing these two these two uh, values but on the other side we uh, understood that the specific volume of the crystals was uh, lower in the case of the treated uh, samples. And this means that though crystals form faster, faster in the presence of inhibitor, um, they occupy a smaller volume and this lower the development of tensile stress and on the other end ensure the hydraulic continuity throughout the, throughout the sample. And this, of course, led to a safer condition for the material four. And these results are nicely in uh, agreement with the results we obtained um, on sodium sulfate crystallization experiments in, in, uh, in bricks uh, using phosphocytrate as, as, as inhibitor. So this is, of course, only a preliminary model. We hopefully will continue this kind of work to, um, to, 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 to get to realize, uh, let's say, a simulation tool to investigate deeper the crystallization modifier. And this uh, is, let's say, one aspect involving mathematical modeling in our, in, in our studies. And uh, I uh, very quickly, I want to show you uh, something about uh, another kind of study uh, where uh, we try to use uh, a well-known method, uh, let's say in thermometrics, uh, and it is the principal component analysis. It's a statistical tool. Mm, we can classify it in this way. And uh, it is, uh, um, it has the, the aim, uh, let's say, to uh, identify the most significant factors influence the, per, the, per, the, sorry, the performance of the proposed conservation treatment actually. And um, I will show you the experimental procedure is exactly the same I mentioned before. So just, I will just skip this. So uh, I will show you the principle and one result. I think I can stay into time. So uh, to realize this study, we uh, considered the 41 crystallization tests. And uh, in this way, we obtained a number of so-called objects, 140. 
each one associated with a single stone sample, each of these objects. And to each object has been assigned a code of four letters, one for each characteristic selected, let's say stone, soul type, stone variety, soul, soul type, soul type inhibitor, inhibitor concentration, and so on. And this, this four actually. And each object has been um, characterized by nine independent variables, that is the values of water loss for exposed surface unit, the one uh, we plot usually in the, our experiments where versus time. Well, um, PCA analysis, uh, uh, let's say, has been performed using uh, a dedicated software and by entering uh, the matrix of data you, you saw simplified in the slide. And uh, 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 let's say that the construction of this predictive model gave us the number of these principal component analysis, which was two. Uh, because the, the software indeed returned a two-dimensional layout. So uh, it's parameterized by coordinates, it's Cartesian, our Cartesian axis actually, and identify, in which is identified the position in, the, in, the, in this multivariate space uh, where most of that are located. Here is the example. And uh, um, one thing, uh, the, the result is called score plot. We have this, this, uh, this method uh, gives us back uh, graph, graphic uh, results. So they are uh, easy actually, uh, not really that easy, but uh, enough easy to read. And um, this score plot, this is the score plot and shows the distribution of the object uh, selected for this study and the different types of stone have been highlighted in here. I highlighted solo, uh, only the different types uh, of stone. And you can see immediately the clustering. This is the, the key of uh, reading this kind of plots. Uh, the clustering, the relative distance between the different objects. And specifically, the more the distance between the object, the more the diversity. And uh, here you can see that the, uh, the data at the first glance are grouped by stone variety. Here you have tough in the, in the center of the graph, you have silicate based material. And uh, on the right side, we have mostly um, stone from south of Sicily and uh, on the left side, you have stone from Malta are two kind of limestone. So, uh, and it, this clustering reflects- Two minutes. Yeah, yeah, I need only one minute, so it's fine. <laughs> and thank you. And um, then let's say that um, this uh, clustering reflects exactly uh, the, the differences in terms of chemical composition and in terms of porous structures, in terms uh, uh, of chemical uh, structures also. So uh, this is a kind of uh, going into the details of uh, um, how, uh, of, of, of the, 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 the peculiar characteristics of the, the factors that mostly influence your experiment, let's say. I will skip these other uh, things and uh, I will, I want to, uh, not really make a conclusion, but rather a remark. And the remark is, is this, it, it is that the concept of transform, transforming the results obtained into mathematical or statistical description to enable different correlation, let's say is, uh, uh, and then identifying the most significant parameters and observation 
when applied inhibition compounds is really essential to disentangle the mechanism through which these inhibitors uh, in the porous materials actually act. And another uh, last but not least, I would like to acknowledge all my co-workers, uh, former co-workers, former student and uh, current student, and particularly from uh, University of Rome Sapienza, uh, Maria Laura Santarelli and Maria Paola Bracciale. They worked with me on this from long, long, very long time. We started together, we can see, we can say, and uh, of course, uh, Roberto Natalini, Gabriella Betti and Mauricio Cesare, Cesare, not only for the work, but also for the invitation to this night. Uh, nice workshop and thank you all for your attention. Okay. Is there any question or comments for now? Giovanni. Hello, Liz. Hello. Ti vedere così ti vedere. Hey. Thank you for your talk. Thank I'm sorry, you. Curiosity. you have a, a, a lot of parameters, okay? Uh, yes, I know. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a curiosity. There is some particular simplified situation where also from a mathematical point of view, possible to have analytic solutions. In sorry. Some, there is some simplified situations where it's possible to have also, I don't know, from a mathematical point of view, some uh, simple analytical solutions. Uh, for example, if you admit some symmetry, something like that, uh, in order to have uh, some guess about the, <laughs> the parameter, because you have a lot of parameter. I, I, I guess that some, my comment is some parameter probably depends to some quantities. For example, yeah. uh, evap evaporation coefficient can be depends uh, during the time, humidity to the pressure to something. Yeah, of course, is, uh, okay. yes, of course, there is. Yes, of course, there is of simplified things. But for example, uh, I mentioned, as I mentioned before, when we talk about this, uh, this, uh, this model of which I am not absolutely expert, but one of the things I, I get is that these two parameters, for example, are particularly important to describe all the, I mean, these two maybe are, are really crucial to understand how this inhibitor works, because in the case of uh, phosphocyprate, for example, we were convinced uh, that the, the um, uh, looking at the experimental results, we were convinced, convinced that it was really difficult. I mean, the, the, the inhibitor delayed the formation of the crystals. That's why they were so smaller when we looked with the microscope inside, because you can have a look at this. We found this situation. At here at the bottom. So they were really smaller and they were uh, apparently they were less, but this is an SEM image. So, you know, it is not really uh, easy to, to have a, a complete picture about this. And so we were actually making a mistake because it was not that it, it is delayed because the crystallization happened to be even faster but the point is that the specific volume of the crystals is really less. So this is a, phase, a safe situation. And you have the possibility to uh, don't interrupt the flux of the, let's say, the, 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 the solution through your material. And you have the crystallization outside the course, which led to let's say an integral structure at the, at finally, you don't have breakage at least. No? So here you can see, for example, the, the dry in front, it is below the surface. So it, it helps, of course, but the parameters are a lot of, 
I agree with you that there are a lot, of course, but in these parameters, we can identify these mm -hmm. uh, specific parameters more uh, uh, significant than others. And also in this other case of the uh, PCA uh, system, this kind of approach, for example, I didn't show you, but uh, you uh, have a result in, uh, in return, which is not only the clustering of different uh, inhibitors or different concentration or different uh, type of stones, but you have all, uh, in this case, uh, the, the, um, let's say the, 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 the indication of uh, uh, which are the phases most important in your uh, experiment, which is the initial phase and the final phase, for example. The, the, in the middle, all these variables uh, stays all grouped, and so it is, makes not a big difference uh, when reflected on the, on the um, on the real experiment, I mean. So it is, uh, uh, they, they are a lot, but it is something uh, over which we uh, need to, to focus. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you again, Asunta. Thank you to you. Uh, we still uh, continue I'm... to collaborate. And uh, so we can uh, pass to the next speaker, which is uh, Cristina Padovani. Cristina. Good afternoon. Yes. Hi, Cristina. Hi. Uh, let me. Okay. Can, you, can you see the slide? We can see the slide and they hear you. Perfect. Okay, perfect. 25 minutes from now. Um, okay, and then two, two, three minutes for questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, so the to the organizers and the chairman. The title of my presentation is the numerical modeling of historical measuring structures. And its goal is to introduce the finite element code NOSA and describe some of its capabilities. So the NOSA Ithaca uh, code is a free software which is developed by the mechanic, mechanics of materials and structures of ISTCNR. It's a finite element code that combines NOSA, the numerical solver, with the open source graphic platform Salom for the pre and post processing operation. The code has been implemented to study the static and the dynamic behavior of measuring constructions of historical interest and uses the constitutive equation of measuring like materials. NOSA Ithaca enables static and dynamic analysis, also in the presence of thermal loads, modal analysis, both standard and bilinear perturbation, and finally model updating, uh, which are, uh, which, which are mm, optimization procedure to calibrate the finite element model via experimental data. Moreover, the capability of modeling restoration and consolidation operations make the code, makes the code a useful tool for uh, maintaining historical buildings. So uh, the measuring materials, uh, materials have the following uh, characteristics. They have uh, the tensile strength is zero or very low, the compressive strength is infinite or very high, and the mechanical properties uh, of the material depend on the constituent elements and on the building techniques used. So, among all the constitutive equations available in the literature for uh, measuring materials, NOSA Ithaca implements the constitutive equation of measuring like or notation material. This constitutive equation is uh, um, inspired by Eyman, uh, by the work of Eyman on measuring arches, and is uh, based on three fundamental hypotheses infinitesimal elasticity. Um, uh, and with, and uh, unilateral constraint on the stress. So admissible stresses must belong to the set of symmetric negative sem semi-definite tensors. And finally, an orthogonality condition between stress and fracture strain. So this equation consider, uh, me considers measuring as a nonlinear elastic material with a zero tensor 
child strength have infinite compressive strength and can realistically model the most significant aspects of mesory behavior. So briefly speaking, uh, given the elasticity tensor, which contains the mechanical properties of the material, I mean uh, the young modulus, uh, the Poisson ratio, and so on, and given the strain tensor, the stress tensor co T corresponding to E, to the strain E, is the projection of C of E onto the set of all symmetric negative semi-definite tensor tensors with respect to a suitable inner product defined in terms of C. So in this way, the strain E is the sum of two parts. Uh, this part, which is the elastic part of strain, which depends linearly on, uh, on the stress, and this part here, which is the inelastic part of the strain, which uh, belongs, uh, which uh, is uh, um, positive semi-definite and orthogonal to T. And this part, this uh, inelastic strain, is also called fracture strain because fractures are expected to be present in the region in which this tensor is different from zero. So, uh, it is possible in this way to consider the stress, the stress function and consider also its derivative. So we consider the stress function T at of E, its derivative the deriv uh, with, with respect to the strain. <coughs> and this derivative can be used to, uh, for the numerical solution of uh, the equilibrium problem. So let us pass to equilibrium problem. Uh, the Nosa Itaca code relies on the on a finite element formulation of the partial differential equations which govern the equilibrium problem of a mesory like solid. So we consider the weak formulation of this boundary value problem. We apply the finite element method and we get this system K, U, uh, K of U, U uh, equal to F, which is nonlinear. And uh, in Nosa Ithaca is solved by using the Newton Repson method, and in particular the tangent stiffness matrix KT, which is calculated starting from the derivative of the stress function with respect to E we, uh, that we have been we have seen before. Moreover, uh, numerical methods for the solution of uh, generalized eigenvalue problems have been implemented in Nosa Ithaca to address the modal analysis of linear elastic structures. So we have to solve, we consider this uh, generalized eigenvalue problem in which matrices K and M are the stiffness matrix and the mass matrix. Both K and M are real matrices N by N symmetric and positive definite with n the number of the of degrees of freedom of the structure and we want to calculate it the first m uh, smallest eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors of this problem so nosa itaca relies on the open source uh, package RPAC and uses the ranchos method so we solve this problem and we calculate the frequencies uh, uh, fi of the structure and the eigenvector of this uh, eigenvalue problem are the uh, mod shapes of the structure bi. So a nice uh, application of uh, Nosa Itaca code is the San Francesco Church in Lucca, which is a typical single nave Franciscan building. Uh, this uh, uh, this church, so uh, at, uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, the so southern wall presented large out of plane deflections and extensive cracks over the window here and near the facade. So uh, reinforcement operations mainly aimed at improving the quality of the masonry and the connections between the wall were conducted in uh, 2013. So uh, it was decided to increase the, the building's resistance to horizontal actions. So a metal framework like uh, this in the figure was constructed at the roof level to brace the structure. Uh, 
then we decided to uh, perform numerical simulations uh, to assess uh, the effectiveness uh, of the reinforcement operations. So firstly, uh, the structure was uh, subjected to the permanent loads. In the figure, you can see the, um, uh, in this picture, you can see the fracture strain in the southern wall. This, the numerical results uh, presents uh, um, the vertical cracks, and this crack, uh, these numerical results are in good agreement uh, with the actual uh, crack pattern uh, on the wall. Mm -hmm. So this uh, analysis uh, uh, refers to the structure without uh, reinforcement. Then we decided to model uh, the structure without strength and intervention and with strength and intervention by uh, applying the permanent loads and uh, horizontal out of plane loads, which uh, uh, models, uh, which model uh, seismic actions. So you, uh, here you can see the vertical stress in the church. And you can see that the passing from the reinforcement from, from the situation with the reinforcement to the situation, sorry, without reinforcement, to the situation with reinforcement, there is a strongly decrease of compressive stress, which can be seen also in the figure in, on the right, which show the maximum, which, uh, which show, shows the maximum values of the compressive stress plotted uh, versus the horizontal force uh, applied to the structure. So this slide here, shows the, um, the crack distribution in the church and in the southern wall before without uh, reinforcement and with reinforcement. And this figure uh, highlights the benefits of the reinforcement, which uh, you can see here reduced the value of the fracture strain and the extension of the cracked region as well. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, so. Now let us consider ambient vibration test because in order to assess the structural behavior of historical monuments, numerical modeling can be integrated and coupled by experimental test. So in the ambient vibration test, the, vibra the vibrations induced by natural and anthropic sources, such as earthquake, earthquakes, wind, traffic, crowd movements, are recorded via sensor network, which is composed by accelerometers and velocimeters, which, are, which is installed on the historical building. Here in this light, you can see the San Frediano Bell Tower in Lucca. And uh, uh, sensors are installed on the tower in uh, some selected points. So you can see here the points, the green and the red points. And uh, um, uh, they, they are installed for a suitably long time. And these sensors measure velocity or accelerations. So you can see here on the right, a, a Sarah Sismic Station uh, installed on the tower. Here in this, uh, in this slide, for the, sake, for the sake of example, you can see on the, on the right rec um, uh, an acceleration recorded on, uh, in uh, 2015. And here on the right, you can see the uh, acceleration of the base of the tower and the acceleration of the top of the tower recorded during the Amatrice earthquake on 24 August 2016. So data uh, recorded during the monitoring campaign are analyzed and processed using a suitable procedure that uh, allow allow to calculate the dynamical properties of the structure, I mean frequencies and model shapes. This approach is known as a operational model analysis. And here in the, in the right, you can see this table, which uh, reports the first five frequencies of the um, San Frediano Bell Tower calculated using the, um, the, um, the records, uh, um, the records uh, in uh, uh, recorded on uh, in uh, 20 in during one year of uh, monitoring campaign so here this uh, this slide show shows how um, 
experimental test and numerical modeling can be uh, coupled and integrated. In fact, uh, um, experimental data uh, can be used to calibrate the finite element model uh, using uh, model updating techniques. So the goal of uh, the model updating is to determine unknown parameters of a structure for example, material properties or boundary conditions and so on, by matching numerical and experimental frequencies and model shapes of this structure. It's uh, an inverse problem in which we have Q experimental frequencies and model shape, so uh, which, uh, has been, uh, which have been uh, obtained uh, via operational model analysis. We uh, build a finite element model. We assume that the um, stiffness matrix K and mass matrix M depend on um, a parameter vector X, which is unknown and uh, which belong to this uh, box here on the right. Then we solve this uh, generalized eigenvalue problem and we calculate the frequencies f of x and model shapes v of x, which of course depend on uh, this parameter, unknown parameter x. Mm? So we consider this function, this function phi, which expresses the distance between the experimental frequencies and the numerical frequencies and where wi are uh, suitable uh, scalars, uh, are weights. And we uh, minimize this objective function in omega and we find the optimal uh, value of the parameter x. If you want to uh, match uh, also the, the eigenvectors, also the model shape, the model shapes, you have to add to the, to the function phi this term here in the box, which measures the discrepancy between experimental and numerical model shapes by means of this quantity gamma i, which are, uh, gamma i is the cosine of the angle between the experimental eigenvectors and the numerical eigenvectors. So we have to solve this uh, uh, minimization problem and uh, we have implemented in Nosa Ithaca a numerical procedure to minimize the, the objective function phi. And this numerical procedure is based on uh, modal reduction. In particular, we build uh, reduced order uh, models, which allow to reduce the size of the finite, finite element model to a more manageable order and on a trust region scheme. So the procedure we have implemented is um, uh, efficient. It allows to manage the larger scale models encountered in the applications, uh, which involve a large number of degrees of freedom. And uh, it's, uh, this uh, numerical procedure is uh, faster than other approaches reported in the literature, where the finite element code, usually commercial finite element code, are used as a black box by general purpose optimizer. So uh, let's see an application of uh, this, uh, um, uh, this procedure. You can see here the clock tower in Luca. The clock tower in Luca has been uh, subjected to a monitoring campaign in 2016. So we know experimental frequencies and model shapes. We build the finite element model of the tower here, which uh, uh, consists of more than 45,000 degrees of freedom. And we consider two materials, material one for the bell chamber and materials material two for the, for the tower. The function, the objective function, we have to minimize is here. And we, have, we, we, we want to match four um, experimental frequencies and the two uh, mod shapes. So the uh, scalar quantities wi are, uh, this, um, are the experimental frequencies to the minus one and the weights uh, for the eigenvector are um, 0 
So you assume that all the um, mechanical properties of the material uh, one of material one and material two are known, and uh, we assume that the the, uh, the parameter unknown is the young modulus of material one and the young modulus of material two, which uh, are assumed to belong to this interval here. So we apply our procedure and uh, we get this uh, solution. These are the optimal values of the uh, young moduli of material one and material two. So you can see here in, uh, in the slide the objective function phi plotted versus E1 and E2. And here uh, on the right, you can see the convergence of the frequencies of the model to the experimental values, which are reported in uh, with the dashed line during the process. So we calculate the numerical frequencies corresponding to the optimal value and the numerical frequencies are reported here in the table and are compared with the experimental frequencies of the tower calculated via operational model analysis and you can see that the relative errors are very small so these numerical frequencies are very close to the experimental ones here in the second table, we compare our approach, our uh, the procedure implemented in Nosa Ithaca with the results obtained by uh, general purpose optimizer. Uh, in particular, we use the Nosa Ithaca code as a black box and, uh, um, and we use the solver, the SPQ solver. Uh, implemented in MATLAB. So you can see that the, um, the numerical frequencies calculated by Nosa Ithaca and uh, those calculated by the general purpose optimized are very close, as well as the optimal parameters. Uh, the computer, as for the computation times, Nosa Ithaca takes um, more or less 27 seconds. Instead, a general purpose optimizer takes 175 seconds. So let us now consider structural health monitoring, which is uh, crucial for the maintenance of, um, of buildings belonging to, to the cultural heritage. Uh, uh, what to say? Uh, in, uh, in recent years, uh, continuous long-term vibration monitoring turned out to be an effective non-destructive technique to investigate the dynamic behavior and check the, st the health status of historical buildings. Long-term monitoring campaign have shown that the changes in the dynamic, the dynamic properties of building, I mean frequencies and model shapes, can represent effective damage indicators. The following slide, the following, the following three slides show how experimental frequencies are sensitive uh, to, um, to environmental events and structural changes. Oh, um, Long-term monitoring uh, campaign have shown that the natural frequencies depend on environmental parameters, such as the temperature and humidity. Here you can see the... Um, Ex uh, experimental frequencies of the San Frediano Bell Tower plotted along with the temperature recorded in January uh, 2016. So you can see this, uh, this behavior of the frequencies and of the temperature. Here in the picture below, you can see the, the first two frequencies of the San Frediano Bell Tower plotted versus the temperature recorded during one year of monitoring. So you can see that um, the dependence of the frequencies on, on temperature is almost linear and that the frequencies tend to increase with the temperature. And this uh, behavior can be explained by the closure of a crux uh, due to the thermal expansion in the material uh, constituting the tower, which thus tends to increase its stiffness. Another uh, 
um, remark is, is that the changes in the dynamic properties over time can represent effective structural damage indicators. So this slide reports the results of a monitoring campaign on the Gabbia Tower in Mantova conducted by the Politecnico di, Mil uh, di Milano. And during the monitoring campaign, the tower was uh, subjected to the Garfagnana earthquake in June 2013. Here on the, on the left, you can see the uh, daily fluctuations of the, of the frequencies uh, due to thermal variation. And here you can see a decrease of the values of the frequencies in, uh, uh, on uh, um, June 21, in, uh, which correspond to the currents of the Garfagnana earthquake. And the author of this, uh, of this study has ever shown that this frequency drop is uh, um, actually associated to, damage, to the damage occurred in the tower after the Garfagnana earthquake. Lastly, uh, we show you this, uh, uh, the, the results of this uh, study on the Mogaduro clock tower in Portugal conducted by the University of Minho. Uh, this uh, uh, is um, uh, the tower. The tower was characterized by many deep cracks and was uh, subjected to rehabilitation works in 2005, including the wall consolidation and the installation tie roads. So you can see here the, um, the frequency of the tower before the rehabilitation and after the rehabilitation. And you can see that after the rehabilitation, the frequency, the frequencies values as um, there is an increase, a strong, a strong increase on uh, the um, frequency values after rehabilitation. And this uh, um, behavior, this fact, it reflects the actual state of, of the tower. I mean, a, a um, lower stiffness structure with many cracks before rehabilitation and a, a higher stiffness structure with no cracks after rehabilitation. So this, uh, um, so the latest uh, um, applications and developments of Noza Itaca are uh, motivated by the results seen before and are oriented towards uh, structural health monitoring. So the goal of this uh, study is to model the influence of the nonlinear behavior of masonry materials and the presence of cracks on the dynamical properties of a, of a masonry structure. So we have implemented in Nosa Ithaca a linear perturbation approach. And this approach yeah, allows- One minute to the left. What, how many minutes? One. <laughs> One. So the, the, um, uh, the um, this approach allows to evaluate the natural frequencies and the model shapes of mesary building in the presence of cracks. And it consists of uh, two, uh, two steps. In the first steps, the prescribed load and the boundary conditions are applied to the, ref, to the model, and we solve the, uh, the nonlinear equilibrium problem. In the second step, a model analysis about the equilibrium solution is conducted by using and uh, by using the tangent stiff matrix, so we solve we consider these eigenvalue uh, eigenvalue problems in which the uh, usual stiffness matrix employed for standard um, model analysis is, is replaced by k tilde, which is the tangent stiffness matrix. So solving this problem, we calculate the frequencies of the of the fracture in the presence of cracks. So just uh, to show you an example, you can see here a perturbation analysis conducted on San Frediano Bell Tower, considering the temperature variation experimented by the tower during the monitoring per period. So you can see here the experimental frequencies, uh, the correlation of the experimental frequencies with the temperature. And you can see, as seen before, that uh, um, frequencies tend to increase with the temperature. And this uh, behavior is confirmed by numerical, um, numerical experiments and by, the, by in particular by, this, by uh, these uh, black uh, squares, we re which represent the, uh, the, frequency, the numerical frequencies of the tower obtained uh, 
conducted the nonlinear uh, analysis and assigning the uh, incremental thermal variation. So I stop here. I just want to, uh, I would like just to mention that this. Uh, uh, activities have been conducted within the framework of these projects funded by the region of Tuscany and Fondazione Casa del Risparmio di, di Lucca. Um, and uh, all the ambient vibration test and the monitoring campaign have been conducted in, in cooperation with the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology. The, um, the results uh, I show you. I show you in this presentation have been uh, uh, obtained in collaboration with Maria Girardi and Daniele Pellegrini from ISTCNR and uh, with uh, Margherita Porcelli from the University of Bologna, Leonardo Robolo, Robol from the University of Pisa. And uh, finally, here you can, there is the website from which you can download the NOSA Ithaca code. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Various results, and maybe we have just time for one. Okay, please come here. Well, I have to watch. That. Yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe you shown the slide, and I didn't see it, but. Uh, the notation condition inside the code is implemented with uh, a cap on the traction. In which way is implemented the notation? Sorry, is it implemented uh, what? The notation condition, how it is, it is implemented inside the code. There is a cap on the traction, there is a... No, yeah, no, no uh, we implemented exactly the constitutive equation of mesory-like materials. So, we, uh, Mm, okay, so we consider we mm, so we implemented exactly this this equation. So we given you, you given the strain tensor he you calculate the stress function t by solving the constitutive equation of mesory like materials in the isotropic case. So you have, uh, we know the explicit solution of the constitutive equation and we implemented the, this constitutive equation. It's uh, the well-known constitutive, constitutive equation uh, proposed by Del Piero Di Pasquale, studied by many authors. And uh, this equation is uh, implemented in the original version, I mean, with a zero tensile strength, and infinite compressive strength, and in a generalized version with, in which we take into account the, um, the bounded uh, compressive strength as well. Okay. Uh, however, this condition uh, is not considered when you talk about dynamic analysis and you, uh, you calculate uh, uh, vibration modes. In that case, you, you do not consider this kind of condition. No. Uh, so in uh, when when uh, I I, di I didn't show here any uh, dynamical analysis, but it is possible to conduct dynam dynamical analysis by using this constitutive equation, and we 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 did it. Okay. Okay. So in Thank the, you. In the, in the ah, okay. Thank you. So sorry to, to short the discussion, but uh, we we have a, a meeting. After the, after the the coffee break with the United States, so we need to accelerate. So I ask to the uh, next speaker. I thank you, Stephen. You have a lot of results. Next, next time you come in Rome, you have whatever. And <laughs> um, so the next uh, speaker is uh, Anastasio Giovannidis from University of Minho in Portugal. Are you here? Anastasis? Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, maybe you can share your presentation. Uh, I will share my screen. Analytical modeling. Uh, are you allowed? To, yeah. Okay. Analytical modeling of shattering sensation so during a rocking motion. And uh, you have a. Yeah, this we need to go. Yeah. 25 minutes, but please stick to the time. Because I will, I will, I will. Okay, let me. Okay, thank you very much.
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for this kind of invitation. I'm very happy to be here even under these circumstances. Uh, my name is Anastasios Givanidis and I'm postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Minho. And today my presentation is titled Analytical Modeling of Chattering Oscillations During Rocking Motion. Before I start my presentation, I would like to give special thanks to my two collaborators for this work. Professor Paolo Lorenzo from the University of Minho and Professor Lies Dimitrokopoulos from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Also to mention that this work is uh, triggered, to be honest, by uh, former work of Professor De Mio and Professor Lenzi, who studied the chattering oscillations uh, for an impacted inverted pendulum. So this is the outline of my presentation. So let's start. Uh, now, first, before we start to the chattering, we need to answer the question, why rocking? Uh, in order to answer such a question, we need to observe that rocking motion is evident in various structures. Uh, and we need to go a bit back in time and realize that ancient structures survive over millennia. Although, we do not know if back, back then they were designed in order to rock. However, we do know that they eventually rock and that they eventually survived. So note that rocking motion is evident also in more modern structures, either for uh, com building contents uh, or to uh, modern bridges, which were designed intentionally to rock during ground excitation. The main design paradigm behind rocking isolation is that it isolates the structure, reducing stresses, and therefore reduces excessive deformations. Now, what is rocking? For the people who are not aware of the term, the simplest rocking structure is a rocking block, is a block as we see here. And when subjected to a ground excitation, it rocks. And I have a video here for your, uh, to visualize what rocking is. We have a simple block studying free on a small shake table, and we apply uh, some pulse type ground motions. And you will realize what rocking motion looks like. Here we have the collapse, but in the next example, you will see uh, the whole uh, rocking response history. So it is this rotation from left to right, left to right, until it comes to rest. So this is what rocking motion looks like. And rocking is evident, as I told you before, in, in, in various masonry structures, from the collapse mechanism of churches to rocking walls to classical columns. As you can see here on the left-hand side, a collapse mechanism of a church can be modeled as a single block uh, exhibiting one-sided rocking motion since it can rotate only from one side since from the other side it's constrained or as a two block mechanism with an internal hinge of course we have the simplest case which is a single block exhibiting two-sided rocking motion since it can rotate from both sides and we have the multi-block columns multi-block mechanisms actually of classical columns since the classical columns are consisted of multi drums so they can be either two or three or uh, any number of uh, uh, block mechanisms of course it's it's evident in masonry arches which we can simulate again other three block mechanism and in masonry facades where due to the weak connectivity between the facade and the remaining structure during an earthquake, the facade re uh, disconnects from the remaining structure and exhibits one-sided rocking. Now, the focus of this study is on a single block mechanism, which undergoes two-sided planar rocking motion from both sides when subjected to weak ground excitation. Why weak and not strong? Because we are interested in the chattering oscillations, as you will see later on. So you're listening to chattering, chattering, but what is chattering? Chattering is a sequence of a theoretically infinite number of low velocity impacts that take place in finite time and bring the structure to rest in the end. 
The most intuitive example of chattering behavior is the bouncing ball, where the ball under gravity and assuming that there is no ground excitation, it follows this trajectory until it comes to rest after theoretically infinite number of impacts. However, in finite time, this finite time is called chattering time. Another example of chattering behavior is the motion of the Euler's disk before reaches its final singularity and stop its motion. So why chattering though is important? Well, chattering is rarely considered in earthquake engineering and especially in rocking dynamics during rocking motion. Why? Because it's believed that since chattering is accompanied by low amplitudes of response, the higher amplitude of response here will remain unaffected. Well, as I will show you later, this phenomenon under circumstances, circumstances, this belief under circumstances is not completely true. So the main objective of this work is to investigate the chattering oscillations during rocking motion. That's why we adopted the simplest rocking structure, which is a rocking block, subjected to the simplest ground excitation, which is sinusoidal pulse. And we're going to investigate the chattering time which is the time needed for the block to come to rest, which here is this tau. So it's from here zero until at some point, which is not defined yet. We will investigate the conditions under which complete chattering happens. And we will reveal, I will show you just some examples of the effect of chattering uh, on the dynamic response. So before I continue with the chattering, I would like to introduce you just two slides regarding some basic principles of rocking dynamics. Uh, this is the equation of motion of the rocking block that you see here on the right hand side. So the equation of motion consists of two uh, parts. The upper part describes the motion for positive uh, rocking rotations and the bottom part for negative rocking rotations. Now we are doing just a transformation here in order to change parameters, nothing fancy. So it's very simple and no need to mention more about this. Now, when rocking initiates, okay, we have a certain uh, threshold for rocking initiation. Rocking initiates when uh, the seismic demand due to the uh, ground excitation is equal to the seismic resistance due to the gravity. So this equilibrium, yields this very simple uh, condition. Uh, so if we transform this into a dimensionless form, when we see in this presentation that the ground excitation is, exceeds the number of one, we have rocking initiation. So in this case, it exceeds the ground excitation slightly. That's why I told you before, we have a weak ground excitation since it is the ground excitation barely initiates rocking. And when impact happens, we use the coefficient of restitution uh, to connect the post-impact angular velocity with a pre-impact angular velocity. Here, we assume that it has a constant value of 0 0.92. And now let's continue with the chattering time. Uh, in order to, um, to to define or to estimate, if you like better, not define, to estimate the chattering time, we need to adopt the perturbation theory. So that's why we introduce a small parameter epsilon, which is connected with the ground excitation. How? The ground excitation amplitude is alpha. We, it can be written as alpha equals to one, which is the rocking initiation threshold, plus epsilon, which is this small, uh, value above the rocking initiation threshold. And the chattering time actually is the summation of the time intervals between consecutive impacts. In particular, delta tau zero, delta tau one, plus, 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 et cetera, which is this. Delta tau zero is from zero to the first impact. Delta tau one is from the first to the second impact. Delta tau two, and so on and so forth. So what we need to define here is 
the expressions of these time intervals, delta tau. In order to do that, we follow, of course, as I told you, the work of Professor Demian Brusselensi. So we assume that the rocking rotation can be written in that form and expanded in Taylor series, where the subscript of phi capital denotes the number of impacts and the superscript the order of derivative. And when impact happens, impact is denoted with this red dot here, as you see here, okay? When impact happens, this rotation becomes zero. And after some small calculations, we have this equation, which will be needed later on. Now, I'm going to present you a bit step-by-step step the procedure. I will skip many details. Uh, first, let's focus on the first cycle of rotation. Here is the shaded area. Here you can see the detail. So from zero to the first time of impact. We have the previous equation. We can derive a similar equation with respect. I skipped the derivation for brevity. Uh, a similar equation of phi, phi capital, I'm sorry. Note that here the, sub, the superscript is zero because the number of impacts is zero during the first trajectory. And we assume that the time interval follows this form. And after we substitute these two equations in the first, we have a hierarchy of equations with respect to the variable epsilons, as you can see here. And if we solve each one of them separately, we have an estimation of the time interval between zero and the first impact. Or if you like, we have an estimation of the first impact tau one here. So this is the main goal. The main goal is for each cycle of rotation to estimate the time of impact and then substitute in the main equation. We do exactly the same thing for the rest impacts. Now we have in general n impacts and not zero anymore. We follow exactly the same procedure and we end up with this equation. Interestingly, this equation takes different form based on the sign of rotation, either when it is positive and when it is negative. So since we have different form, we have two different equations. We solve the problem separately for the negative rotations first. We solve the equation, we take uh, the lowest order of approximation of the time impact. And for the positive rotations here and here the, in detail, we solve again the same equation, but it's slightly different. I will skip the details. And we end up again with the lowest order of approximation of the time of impacts that correspond to positive rocking rotations, of course. In sum, for all orders, for the lowest order of approximation, for this first cycle of rotation, I saw to you analytically how much is the, the lowest order of approximation. For the next uh, positive uh, uh, rotations, we have the lowest order of approximation. And for the negative rotations, again, the same thing. And the only thing that we can do is just substitute either in this or on that. Is there, these are equivalent uh, uh, expressions to estimate the chattering time. The chattering time, which I remind you, is the time from here to here until the block comes to rest. Now, let's continue with the conditions that uh, complete chattering occurs, which I need to explain to you what complete chattering is. Well, it's a sequence of a theoretically infinite number of low velocity impacts that bring the structure to rest. So in the end, the structure comes to rest. However, incomplete, the only difference is that in the end, the structure is not coming to rest. So it still oscillates, it's still rocking. Uh, so let's, we are interested here for only for the complete shattering. So assume that we have again the same weak ground acceleration, weak ground excitation. We have, we already know the rocking initiation threshold. And we have the weak, as I told you. So whenever the ground excitation exceeds this threshold, we have 
rocking motion and until it exceeds again here we have rocking reinitiation so if since we are interested in complete shattering what we want actually is the block to start rocking at this time instant and before this time instant comes it's it's rocking motion to stop its velocity and rotation to be zero so this maximum uh, time frame if you like is uh, the period of the frequency divided by two. So it, in order to have complete shattering, this condition needs to be um, true. So by increasing the amplitude of the excitation, of course, intuitively, we increase the oscillations of the structure, we increase the oscillations, and subsequently, we increase the shattering time until a point alpha critical here until the point where the chattering time becomes or the ratio if you like becomes one which implies that the chattering time became equal with half the period of the excitation for larger values the complete chattering becomes incomplete so what actually we showed here is that when a ground excitation is capable of initiate rocking motion which means that its amplitude should be larger than one. And below this green dotted line, we expect from the structure to exhibit complete shattering and comes to and come to rest before the next lobe here of uh, ground excitation re-excites the block. Now, if we solve this problem numerically for different values of the coefficient of restitution, we have we take let's say an equation that describes this boundary ground acceleration amplitude boundary which gives for different values of the coefficient of restitution how much is the critical ground acceleration and finally uh, let's see just a few examples to see the uh, influence that complete shattering might have on the response and when. To remind you, this is the equation of motion for positive and uh, negative rotations. We just make simple transformation here in order to be everything as dimensional as forms. And we take two cases where shattering is considered and when shattering is overlooked. And here I plot two results. With a red dotted line, you see when chattering is considered, and with a black uh, straight line, chattering is overlooked. The structure is subjected to two MP pulses after my my previous Papagior U pulses. You will realize that in these both pulses, there are areas, there are time segments where the ground acceleration is exceeds the rocking initiation threshold and it is below the complete shattering threshold. So we expect here to remind you that from that time frame, which is called initiation, to that time instant, which is called reinitiation, because here it's the next time instant where the ground acceleration is exceeds again the threshold, we expect on this time frame the block to seize its rocking oscillations or chattering oscillations. Therefore, the main difference between uh, these two cases is actually the initial conditions when they enter the next uh, cycle of rotation. In other words, when chattering is considered, we showed that after this specific time, estimated time, the block, uh, uh, stop stops rocking and when it enters this next cycle of rotation its initial conditions are rotation zero angular velocity zero however when chattering is not considered the black line here its initial conditions are non-zero therefore this small difference on the initial conditions between the two cases co might have con considerable consequences here you see a completely different response. And here in one case, we have collapse. However, in the other case, we do not have collapse. The block comes back to uh, its rest initial uh, position. So 
To finish my current presentation, uh, what we discussed today is we investigated the chattering phenomena during rocking motion. That's why we adopted the small, the sorry, the simplest uh, rocking structure, which is a rocking block, when subjected to the uh, simplest uh, ground excitation, which is a sinusoidal pulse. And following the work of Prof Professor Demi and Professor Lenzi, uh, we proposed a semi-analytical approach to approximate the chattering time. To remind you, chattering time is the time that the block needs to stop rocking. And we showed also the boundaries of ground acceleration within which we expect from the block complete chattering behavior and its velocity and rotation to become zero before the next lobe of ground acceleration re-excites the block. And with some simple examples that I present you, I show to you that complete chattering, when it is overlooked, it might have uh, major consequences, of course, when the ground acceleration lies within the proposed boundaries. That is for me today. I would like to thank you again for your kind attention. I hope I was within limits. Yeah, yeah, you're perfect. Okay, nice. Thank you very much. I don't want to take your uh, break, so thank you. Uh, um, uh, is there any question or comment? Um, but for earthquake, do you have a, a sort of a recommendation? to deal with this kind of phenomenon? Yes, uh, it, this is an interesting uh, question. And thank you about that. For uh, As I show you today, is just the simplest cases for uh, pulses. However, we are working now currently the most complicated phenomenon under earthquakes. So yes, there is a procedure, but it's not done yet, completely done yet, in order to present you and tell you uh, what happens when an earthquake happens okay when an earthquake occurs because it's the earthquake the, the, the earthquake signal is completely random so we need to um you know it's not a sign pilot which is easy way from yeah, yeah. and we need to modify a bit our procedure yeah no, but it's important to have recommendation exactly for instance uh, if they have elements uh, they have to project and so okay exactly 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 so thank you very much for this interesting. Thank event. you, thank you. And, uh, so now we have a very short coffee break because uh, we have uh, uh, this meeting with the English de Bechy at uh, five. So just uh, 15 minutes sharp, and then we will be back here with Ingrid for uh, her presentation.
Okay. So we start in the two minutes. And uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Two minutes because we are waiting for some people. Uh, uh, how many people are on this? I'm not sure I'm a client. Okay. 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 Look at your conference at uh, Matrix uh, from Imaginary uh, oh, okay. some days ago. Very, really beautiful, nice. So it's impressive. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Well, this you will be a entirely lot of work. A lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's 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 still ongoing. I mean, uh, we are adding the last two elements as we as we see it in a test site. We uh, we notice that there are areas that oh. can be. <laughs> okay yeah so now now we are going to to um to pass to the conference mood because we are starting really <laughs> so <laughs> um okay we can start now and uh here we have Professor Ingrid Dobeschi, which is now a distinguished, uh, distinguished professor of mathematics and electrical and computer engineering. And um, that's really an honor you are here today uh, for this our, our workshop. Um, and the, the title of your talk is uh, X-ray separation and underdrawing extraction. We have uh, 50 minutes, more or less. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's an honor for me to be uh, talking to you, and uh, I'm sorry that I, I, given the time difference, it was not easy for me to uh, uh, you can... the other work part of of, of uh... So, uh, without further ado, let me uh, uh, bring up my my talk. Let me share my screen and bring up my talk. So mm -hmm. I'll go to uh, full screen. OK, so I thought that. Uh, maybe, sorry, sorry. Maybe you have yes? to, uh, I don't know, the, the sound is very low. Maybe you can increase the, the volume of, of your microphone, I don't know. Uh, I will try. Yeah. Um, hmm? I don't know that I can actually. Let me try. Let me see. What's this? Better mic. Just a moment, because maybe that's. A, I don't know if it's our problem, but because before it was, a, because we are mixed. We have a people online and people in the room, uh -huh. uh, listening. And uh, here is the, I, I can listen to you. I can, I can hear you, but uh, in, in, uh, the on the other side of the room they cannot uh, hear you. I see. So, so uh, maybe maybe you, you need a, a speaker. Uh, 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 we we had a speaker, but uh, uh, before it was uh, the pre previous uh, talk. It was uh, working. And now it's very low. I don't know if. Uh, so I'm like I'm trying to see whether uh, I can do something to my output sound. I have not found it yet. No, non l'abbiamo messo così. 
Non perché non stava qui il libro. Non vedi al massimo. Ti controlliamo, vedi se riesci a rivedere il nostro libro. Eh? Il volume del computer. Aspetta. Sorry, eh? Questo è il microfono. Eh? Non lo posso controllare. Cosa c'è? Perché non lo so. Just a moment. Is my input volume better? Is it better now? Yes. Yeah, a bit better, yeah. A bit better, I can try to go further still. That's the maximum I can do. Yeah, yeah, much better, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So. Okay, so start again. <laughs> um, so let me share and go to my slides. Um, so I thought that I will talk about the uh, topics I indicated, but I thought uh, uh, that I would also tell you about some other projects I've been involved with earlier. Uh, that involve image analysis and information theory, because I thought you probably would uh, have uh, more interest in seeing a range than very technical details of, of, of what we what, what I'm going to do uh, or talk about. And we can go into technical details in the questions if you like. So I thought I would review some older results. Uh, 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 and I can, I'm trying to see whether I can get into a better mode. Yes, this is a better mode. So, uh, uh, so some uh, uh, actually the, the 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 thing that launched me in uh, 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 working with art historians and art conservators uh, with the Van Gogh Museum and uh, some projects on earlier under drawings, and then I'll come to the uh, ongoing collaboration. So. Um, Oops, I seem to not be in the right presentation. No, I am not, sorry. Uh, I want to be in this one. Okay, so I apologize for that. So let me go back to presentation mode. Okay, so uh, uh, in, in about, I don't know, uh, um, maybe 12 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, uh, I participated in a workshop at the Van Gogh Museum that was organized by the Van Gogh Museum and by Rick Johnson of Cornell. And we were given uh, data of uh, uh, Van Gogh paintings and asked whether we could characterize them uh, in by style, whether there was a way in which we would analyze them and maybe find uh, uh, classification of them. Uh, in particular, we were given uh, authentic paintings by Van Gogh and then other paintings that at some point had been mistaken for Van Gogh because they were in his private collection. And, uh, but they in fact were uh, by, by a friend of his and they had swapped paintings or because they were forgeries or copies and uh, see whether we could distinguish them. So um, we, well, I, 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 what we did was we decided, uh, my students and I, to determine the information in these paintings by Van Gogh at different scales. At the time, we were only given black and white copies, so we worked with the black and white copies of the paintings. And uh, one thing that uh, uh, is, is very uh, standard in image analysis is to try to decompose them into different scales and see what information you can gather. So if you, one way of, of seeing what is fine detail and what is not is to just remove some fine details. So you blur it a little bit. And then because the images are digitized, every pixel has a number that's between uh, zero and 255, meaning all black or all white. And in between you have all these levels of gray. So you can per pixel compute the difference once you have blurred it. And that will give you an image too. And you don't see much if you actually enhance it. You see that you get all the fine lines because it's exactly where you have a, a, a sudden difference in level uh, that you uh, uh, will, in, in gray level, that blurring has changed the information a lot. And so that's where you, the difference will, will, will point that out. So uh, if you do that, 
we do that at many different scales. So I'm going to show this to you, but you should imagine it over the whole picture, just on a little detail. And uh, if we enlarge that every time, uh, so we blur these different things. We can then look at different the differences. And the color here in these differences is just to indicate what's positive and what's negative. So it doesn't, it's just artificial color to, to make clear what's going on. Uh, and when you look at all these successive differences, there's something that strikes. For instance, there are places where you see the same feature everywhere. And that's because there was a very sharp edge in of that detail. And so every time the difference brings that out. But there are other regions where you see that at the first level, there was nothing much, then something occurred, and then it disappeared again. So you actually have detail that emerges that exists at all scales for sharp edges, or that emerges at some scales and then disappears again. So you can try to look, and you can do this in many different directions, you can try to make a statistical analysis of, of, of these, where things emerge and disappear and in what directions this predominantly happens. And in some sense, you have made a, 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 techni a, a technological kind of a, a digitized a, a snapshot of characteristics of the painting style. Uh, it is not in a painterly term. I mean, we can't go to the painter and say, and, and give him information about what we have observed, but it is something that characterizes uh, different, different paintings, different styles. So what we did was we used this information and to characterize uh, in all these paintings that we were given, the uh, uh, paintings by Van Gogh, and, and, and others in this collection of paintings that uh, some had thought were by Van Gogh and, and uh, or that had to a forgeries of Van Gogh. And let me try to see whether I can play that little movie for you. So uh, here, does it play? Can somebody tell me? I hope it does. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's okay. okay. Yeah. So what you see, is here, it's a mobile. So what we did is we, we made a little artificial, a virtual mobile of the paintings. The ones with the red dot are the ones that are not really by Van Gogh. And uh, uh, what you see is that in this mobile, uh, so what we did with all these statistics, we managed to then compare paintings with each other and define an artificial uh, 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 distance between the paintings. And then what, with all these distances, we could try to make a mobile that respected those computer distances, which won't really fit in three dimensions, but as much as, as best possible uh, in order to visualize the information. And what you see is that the red dots are mostly towards the outside of this cloud. So we felt we had done a good capturing. But you see the one that comes now at the top here uh, uh, at its red dot is in fact a very famous forgery of Van Gogh from the 30s. And let me play it again. And uh, although it's not at the center, it's also not extremely at the outside of the cloud. Well, so that meant that the forger had done a reasonable jo job in capturing at least certain particulars of the style. So sometimes I'm quoted in, 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 in the popular literature brought tools to, to detect forgeries. But I mean, it's not really, it's very flashy, but it's not really true, nor have I ever claimed that, because uh, uh, what we can is detect very easily forgeries that you all experts would detect immediately as well. It's the ones that are very, very difficult to de detect that actually we don't do very well at either. And so, uh, uh, so if ever anybody tells you again that I'm an expert at detecting forgeries, you can tell them that you heard it from me that it's not true and I've never claimed that. Okay, so uh, let me uh, cut this uh, and, and go back to the presentation. Uh, sorry, where am I here? Okay, so uh, the first... Uh, 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 big thing we did. But the interesting thing, although it's it's one of the, as I said, my least favorite uh, 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 projects, uh, 
it, it led to many others. So uh, uh, Joris Dick and, and Koen Janssen were, uh, uh, who are, Joris Dick is both a um, uh, 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 material scientist and a uh, uh, very active in art uh, history and art conservation, uh, uh, had about, uh, when was this, uh, 10 years ago or so, had, had, had a, a, a front page of this journal of analytical chemistry because they had used uh, XRF, uh, X-ray uh, fluorescent uh, by Van Gogh, which is a, a painting, well, it's really a patch of grass like this, uh, but if you turn it on its side, as I was doing earlier, and then you x-ray it, then you see, and this was well known, that there is an, a portrait underneath, and they had then uh, uh, actually gotten permission to analyze this painting with a high energy x-ray source, uh, at the time, they had not built yet a portable apparatus to do this. So they took it to a teaching hospital in Amsterdam, where it was uh, examined uh, with the uh, very powerful X-ray that's also used to make short-lived uh, radioactive materials that are used for medical tests. And uh, whenever there's one of these, these big machines, they're very costly. They try to also build a place where it can be used for research because physicists using this help them pay for the machine. When it's not doing its medical job, the beam is the research uh, uh, room and there it can do other tasks that help pay. So they had gotten time on this uh, detector and uh, they, they uh, analyzed in data cube. Uh, they had images, for instance, for our scene, uh, which is uh, one of the components of uh, uh, vermilion that Van Gogh used, and uh, for molybdenum, which is a component of the Naples yellow that he was using. And from that, they colorized and they made this picture that then uh, uh, made a splash. In, 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 if at that time you Googled it, you would, you would uh, Van Gogh portrait woman, most of the images that would come up was of, of, of this. Um, and, but they asked us, asked me whether we could with the data cube do better. I mean, using image analysis. So we got the raw data cube. And the first thing we noticed was that in the raw data cube, uh, there were all these kind of weird artifacts. And this was, when I asked them, they said, oh, well, this was because uh, it's always in the same place. And it analyzes little area by little area of the paint. Examined uh, under the beam. But of course, since this beam was every so often used, uh, diverted and used elsewhere on its day job, uh, the sled had to stop when uh, the, the, the beam was, was uh, directed. And it turned out that there was a over, back and forth over the image. Occasionally, I mean, it made mistakes. It stopped, it, it, it's one, not at the right places. And so when they took the data, that meant that they had all these zigzaggy mistakes in the, in the image. So the first thing we had to do, and I said, well, you didn't. Smaller than the ones we corrected by hand. Can you do that mathematically? And yes, we can, because what we can say is, we can say, look, in every line, we assume that there might be up to 10 mistakes. Uh, if you allow for up to 10 mistakes, can you, by readjusting, get an image that's much more likely to have these black spots. These black spots are caused by the fact that the X-ray couldn't always penetrate because on the top painting, Van Gogh had 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 uh, paint impasto uh, in the painting that he painted in in, in in Paris, and so this made these bigger bigger uh, protuberances. So um, so those couldn't be penetrated, and uh, so indeed we could. Uh, correct, we did that, we first found an algorithm to, to, to correct the whole painting uh, optimally. And then we worked from there. We did the same correction in the whole data cube. 
uh, and then uh, we impaint it because it's just like when art conservators in paint, you really have information on the, 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 the portion that is lost because you know it was a brush stroke. You know it highly likely had colors very similar to what was near there. And uh, sometimes you can even see the brush stroke. I mean, uh, so what you can do is you can mask out those areas where, and then you can reconstruct, and we did that with mathematical algorithms, what was likely there. And that was that. Then for the long strips that came from the grass that was overpainting it, we uh, uh, likewise uh, uh, impainted. We found a different algorithm to impaint those. And so we could adapt ourselves to that. And then we had one area around the eye where we still had problems. And there we didn't quite know what to do, but conservators told us, you know, when we have paint losses in one eye, we look at the other eye. And so once we knew that, we could do that too. And so we had now very nicely corrected. And you see how subtle these mathematical uh, algorithms are in, in correcting uh, the, 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 all, all the, 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 do the impainting on these different images. So once we had that, uh, so we wanted to bring in color like, like Joris Dick and Kun Janssen had done. Now, one reason why the color they had was uh, poor is that the XRF didn't give them information on all the pigments. They didn't have anything on the earth colors because in the spectrum that they had observed, there were no responses from the ingredients of the, of the, the earth colors. So, uh, uh, so they were missing a, a whole lot of them. They also made, were missing blues. So, um, we decided that we would try to infer from. So the reason people uh, wanted to know is from a series of paintings of portraits that Van Gogh painted when he was in uh, uh, Nunen with his parents, where he first lived with Theo and then went to other areas of France. Um, Oops, are you still hearing me? I get a message that my internet connection is unstable. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit unstable, but uh, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. fine. Sometimes okay. You, you, we, we lose something, but uh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but many times the, the, the images are very fixed. They're not moving very much. So maybe that helps. Um, so uh, the, the, the paintings he painted there were uh, portraits of peasants in very poor light conditions. And he was experimenting with how with a very limited palette, nevertheless give an impression of color. And he had written letters about that to his brother, Theo van Gogh, who, uh, with whom he exchanged a lively correspondence his whole life. And uh, I believe that in this portrait that I'm sending you with this letter, I. I succeeded particularly well. Now, although that letter is preserved, the painting is not known. Now, on the other hand, that painting was sent to Paris. And in Paris, from the period when Van Gogh was in Paris, we have this study of grass under which there is a Noonan portrait. And well, that would mean that he would have overpainted it. Well, not so unlikely. I mean, once uh, Van Gogh got to Paris, he completely changed his style. So it's not impossible that he would not have valued as much this painting that he earlier period uh, now that he was painting with much more impasto more color so it's believed that that painting he was describing in the letter was the one underneath the, the patches of grass and because he thought it people were interested in seeing how it was. So that's why there was all this interest in it. So what we did is we took lots of paintings from the same period. And here is one with very little contrast. Contrast. And an interesting thing is that when you analyze these paintings in, uh, uh, in, 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 in GB, that's how they look. But when you analyze them differently, here you use them in Chromans and, and, and uh, uh, so this is the Chromans distribution. Now you see it's very, very different. You have this violet and this and so on, but these are the dark areas where something is very, very dark. What you see is black. I mean, once you put in Chromans, it tries to see is the black more violet or more yellow or more and so on. 
but they don't really count. So let's take them away. And once you do that, you see that there is in this way of representing it digitally, very great similarity. And these give us a way of inferring from what we could measure uh, uh, in the cube, other colors. And so we did that. And that's how we got this view. You to the view on the right, which gave us a much better impression of, of the painting. So, which is a, a project that we really very much enjoyed. Uh, I gave a talk about that in Belgium and Maximilian Martin said, oh my God, maybe you can help us with something else. And so this is this project, uh, Golsen van der Weyden, who is a, uh, a, a less famous son of his very famous grandfather, uh, Rogier van der Weyden, but he still produced beautiful uh, little paintings. Many more pupils than most masters of his period. And a, uh, a photograph of an exquisite little uh, uh, by Hosen van der Weyden. Here you see it a little larger. And uh, what, what uh, uh, Maximilian Martens had found was that in, uh, when he looked at the underdrawings in Hosen van der Weyden, he found a, a, what he thought was a very funny picture. I mean, uh, so uh, what, what uh, uh, there were many different classes of underpaintings. So uh, here from this painting and some other uh, uh, he singled out for me, in order to explain to me what he meant, four areas in which look at the underdrawings, very, very different thought were just kind of like, like uh, what you would draw on, on just lines for shading and lines for curved shading. And then there were other areas where he it really face I mean he was really sketching with a very fluid medium and then there were areas where he didn't even sketch I mean he just indicated something very summarily I mean like eyes more or less here face there wavy hair there and uh, now he felt that it was not unusual for an artist uh, uh, to evolve in the way they made underdrawings during their career. Um, but here we were seeing these in, within the same paintings. And uh, he wondered whether this, this kind of information of where do I want to shade, which he wouldn't do for himself as a mature artist. I mean, look, if, 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 what, if you indicate a face this way, then you're not at the same level as where you want to indicate all time. So he thought maybe this meant that part of it was going to be painted by another hand, somebody who needed more guidance in painting, while the things that he was going to do himself, like the, the, the face of, of, of this lady, he did a little bit of sketchy information. So he wondered what you could see from the, uh, once you extracted the underdrawing, you see here even more the, the contrast between them, whether you could see the difference surface from uh, of, of, of the hand uh, if there was also a difference in underdrawing. So what he did, and I'm sorry, I, 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 I can't show you the, 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 the blind uh, data set images because I, 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 I don't have uh, permission to, to, to project them. But what he did is he gave us a blind data set where he knew what the underdrawings were of other paintings. And he told us, can you, from all these little details, classify? Can you tell me these look more like the ones that had underdrawings that were very detailed, or these look more like under, other sets that had underdrawings that were just sketchy? And it turned out he gave us seven of them, that of the seven, six of them we could uh, characterize exact, uh, precisely. So uh, this is, in a sense, although it's, it's, it's an older set, uh, we are with set of, 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 of these uh, uh, classifying of underdrawings in order to, uh, uh, to, to take this project one step further. 
And in the meantime, we have learned a lot about how to extract underdrawings. So I'll come back to that. Okay. These, as I said, I was going to start by all the results that uh, uh, I had done in different directions. Let me now talk about more recent results. Uh, so these are in collaboration groups at the National Gallery in London, University College London, the groups of uh, at National Gallery, group directed by Catherine Higgett, uh, at University College by and at Imperial College London by Pierluigi Dragotti. So uh, you can find out there's a website for this whole collaboration at uh, 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 National Gallery in London. Uh, the project is called Arctic. Uh, uh, the funding is because it came from uh, the uh, British British funding source, but uh, uh, researchers at Duke, uh, uh, some of my postdoc and, and undergraduates uh, are uh, working on, on together with this group. We have weekly meetings and we, 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 we work in a, uh, many different directions which are documented on the website. But let me talk about two of them. So one is X-ray separation, and the other one will be underdrawing extraction from imaging hypertubes. So X-ray separation, so, well, you all know, I forgot to insert a picture, but these are uh, 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 details, well, panels from a, uh, the, the Van Gogh, uh, the Van Eyck uh, masterpiece in Ghent, the, the Van Eyck altarpiece. Uh, uh, the Adoration of the Lamb, of the Mystic Lamb. And uh, we are looking here at uh, the, uh, the doors of this polyptych, which is a huge polyptych. And on the two extreme panels, on the left, uh, when the, the, the thing is open, you see Adam. And on the right, you see Eve. And now once the polyptych is closed, you see uh, another scene, well, because the doors are painted on both sides. And you see here on the verso of Adam, uh, uh, the, the, this, this, this landscape site with a, a, a smaller scene at the top, and Eve also, again, with a, 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 a smaller uh, scene with a person on top of that. And once you take x-rays of these, of course, you see both, because the x-ray goes through it, and you, you get both. And uh, something that I had been told by Maximilian Martens, as they were uh, investigating uh, uh, this, uh, doing the big uh, uh, campaign of studying and then restoring the altarpiece, was that it was a real nuisance to have to try to read these X-ray panels, these X-rays of pa panels painted on both sides. <clears throat> the reason is that our visual system is extraordinarily good at some tasks, but it's very bad at separating two things like that. And so he asked, can you uh, uh, do something about it? And uh, so here is an of, of, of one of these little paintings with the, uh, a piece of x-ray and you see in the bottom which you very clearly see also on the x-ray, you see eye coming through. We concentrated on, as, as a, a case study, on this piece of the x-ray. And we tried to, from, because it's an interesting, what's called a source separation problem for image uh, processors or for signal processors. Uh, it is something where you have position of two sources and you're trying to separate them. Uh, it is something, source separation is something that we do when we are in a crowded room and we try to pick out one conversation. I mean, you have all this other noise and with our uh, audio system, we actually are very good at that. Uh, um, visually, we're not. Uh, we, um, so we, we, in this case, of course, you have side information. You have these two visuals and uh, until a few years ago, with the best of techniques that we, we, we could do, we actually succeeded reasonably well. I mean, but we weren't very happy with results. See the fold, you still see a ghost of the eye in, in, in the folded piece. Uh, 
And recently we became uh, uh, much better at this uh, using uh, some of the techniques, uh, combining all the techniques we had before with neural networks, which is a very uh, uh, little bit of frustrating thing for somebody who believes in, in uh, mathematics and in understanding what you're doing as much as I do, because neural networks, I mean, they are very successful at some of the things they do. And I feel you can't argue with success. And so we're using them. On the other hand, and why they work as well as they do. So uh, in a different uh, uh, direction of research, I also am trying to really uh, uh, look mathematically at why is it, how come that these neural networks with all their computation power are so good. I mean, uh, they, they do complicated things inside which we want to understand better. But so we, uh, at the request of the people in, in, in Ghent, and uh, we, uh, uh, their foot area. And uh, so here Adam is, and I'm looking at these things in detail that you realize what an extraordinary perfectionist uh, Adam was. I mean, you see individual hairs painted on the leg of Adam. Uh, so this is the other side. This is the combined X-ray. And with our present methods, we get this for the X-ray of one side. Like this for the other side. Here you see on the left and on the right, the uh, X-ray, the true X-ray, the sum of the two components that I just showed you. And here you see the difference between the last two things I showed you. So we haven't done a perfect job yet because you can still, I don't know whether it comes through, but in certainly on, on, on what I have, I can still see ghosts of the toes of Adam and so on, but we are doing much better than we uh, even dreamed of doing uh, uh, three or four years ago. So uh, making progress and hoping that we will continue to make progress. So finally, I'd like to tell you a little bit in my last few minutes about underdrawing extraction from an imaging hypercube this is work, I mean, for all the people with many different people, but all the people there are mentioned on, on, on the website that I gave you earlier. I just know that for uh, this project, uh, uh, Wallace Peasley, who I may be in the audience here, uh, 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 is not yet mentioned on the website, and I'll ask him to correct that sooner, but that's why I wanted to single him out. Uh, Wallace is an undergraduate. Uh, uh, we're working with two different undergraduates at Duke, uh, um, Ashley Kwan and Wallace Peasley, who has done beautiful work on this underdrawing extraction. So what's going on here? So uh, as a case example, uh, uh, we were asked to contribute to the research on this beautiful painting in the National Gallery that's by uh, Lippi and Botticelli. And uh, uh, researchers there were interested in whether one could find uh, uh, indications as to what was by whose hand. Could one distinguish two or even more if other uh, pupils of Lippi had also contributed to it? Uh, 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 hands in this painting. So uh, for that, they did a, a thorough imaging job on this painting. And uh, uh, I'll show you a particular uh, 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 images of this particular section. And uh, so here are, are here and show you again a little movie because uh, what, what's done is that uh, a, uh, this, so this is a, you see it slowly changing, I'll play it several times. But what I'm, the, 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 Of, of the reflected images of, of this. So let me play it again. And what I want you to, to pay attention to is that under more or less visible in different areas. 
I mean, the underdrawing of the person kneeling at the front is almost always very visible. But uh, the, uh, there are other underdrawings, for instance, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the coat here or in, in, at the back that become more visible. If things are and then becoming less visible again. Or similarly, on the left here, we had underdrawings emerging and disappearing. So in order to really get is to uh, view uh, uh, this, this uh, all these different uh, uh, views and, and try to extract underdrawing by hand, which is a very painstaking uh, uh, job. And so uh, what Wallace and Barak have worked on is to actually extract from the whole hypercube, find the best for each, 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 uh, 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 each position for each underdrawing, find where it came out best in an automatic way in order to then present a synthesis to the researchers. And so we saw the movie and uh, I'm going to conclude with this, this end result. So this is one in which uh, a, a view of all the different uh, underdrawings uh, uh, as they come out. It's not our goal to then start making a drawing of this. I mean, we feel we leave that best in the hands of experts who, who, who know what we're doing. The image processing we want to extract from it information in a decent and justifiable way that then can be used by experts for, for more. And uh, I actually, uh, had, uh, so that gives us a little bit more uh, time for questions. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, so um, very interesting and uh, there are a lot of uh, ideas. But first of all, I have a question for you, but um, here is about the drawing, <clears throat> but what about color? When you do this uh, x-rays, you are losing the quality of the colors. Huh? So how do you use the information given by the different painting, the different colors and so on? There is a possibility to do that. The, the, the okay, material. Okay, so, yes. Yeah. So uh, the, the color information, I'm, I'm hearing an echo. So uh, the color information, x-ray what we did is we used the rgb images as an indication of uh of what belonged to what to help us separate uh, uh in in the x-ray separation uh because you you know that in the x-ray the superposed x-ray yeah together and uh you, you are trying to, to make imaginary x-rays that could have resulted from painting it only on one side of the panel. Uh, so that's the goal. And actually one of the questions we had was, what do we do? Because I think we would do a better job if we separate it into three pieces. One which on the one to each of the sides of the painted sides because I do feel the wood grain is something we can separate out well. And I think we would get a sharper result. Uh, and and uh, that's probably something that we will do in the next stage. Okay, okay. Uh, Thank you. And- uh, But color, when we the x-ray, we don't really use color at all. Uh, when we, when we uh, look at the infrared, the hypercube, it's clear that we get a lot of information still visible from the colored surface because that also we need to kind of remove that as much as possible and uh, that in bringing out the underdrawings 
Okay, and we have another question. Come here, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Is a is a question is a question related to the the color. <laughs> but for the first uh, part, is an emotional question because my first meeting with the Van Gogh artwork, the very impressive is the color, because <laughs> because I, I think if you want to find some metric in order to evaluate. Uh, to the Van Gogh, I think to insert the color because for me, for my motion, the color is very, it's very amazing. If you, yeah. In, in our first analysis, it was not a, a choice we made of not using color. What happened is this was about 15 years ago, 13 years ago. Museums were then very careful about sharing high resolution data of their paintings. They've become a little bit more trust now. And also at that time, it was the first time I did such a collaboration. So they were, I guess, worried. I don't know what they were worried about, what to do with the data, but we had to, to sign very stringent uh, contracts about uh, how our soul would be stolen if we ever divulged them. I mean, uh, but uh, so, the uh, even so, they did give us high resolution only for black and white. So that's why then we worked with only black and white, which I mean, I agree completely that Verhoek is all about color. I mean, of course. Uh, and, and so definitely if we were to do an analysis again of, of Van Gogh's style, uh, we would involve color a lot. I mean, uh, but I I think at that time also, I think they were still trying to was it that uh, image processing or this kind of analysis could bring to the field. And so this was a first question. I don't think that we will bring something useful to style analysis. I think Art historians, art curators, art uh, conservators are incredibly visually trained people. They can do this much better than what we can do. With our pictures. <laughs> okay. What we can do that is hard for people, like separating X rays or bringing many images, many hypercubes together to get one hype, uh, and so on. So as as the years went by, I think better questions were formulated for us. So. I don't expect try to analyze the style of an artist again because I don't think it's a useful thing for us to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, another curiosity about the in painting <clears throat> because yes. uh, I there is a, your your approach is more statistical or use some PDEs or something no, because. No, no. Uh, Painting, we use uh, many different things. Uh, uh, you, you use a, a, a gradual, just like uh, uh, conservators when they impaint, you, you go very gradually from the edges and studying the, the pilots one, you paint in and then more and more and more. And so uh, you, uh, uh, you, you use both PDE and also an ex in, 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 in wavelets and so on to help you with all that. Thank you. Okay. It was Professor Giovanni Naldi from Milan, anyway. <laughs> I didn't say. <laughs> so, um, are there other questions uh, or comments or curiosity? One question? Yeah. Okay. Michela Spagnolo from Siena. Really, thank you again for your, for your talk. It was very, very nice. Uh, coming to Van Gogh. Uh, color is definitely one of the features that really is uh, stunning, but I was also impressed by another feature, which is the the the, the depth, the, the quantity of uh, painter painting that is on the on the on the pictures. So, in this sense, do you think that also taking into account the three D or let's say the two and a half D shape of the painting can improve, and how these techniques could be used in a kind of integrated fashion. So to have 2D, gray levels, color, 3D, and the like. So, so uh, I know 
has is measuring uh, a 3D information like that, and uh, you can. I know that some people are 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 using this to make uh, 3D printed copies. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, and I think they will indeed uh, uh, a richer feel in the copy than a uh, 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 flat uh, uh, painting could, uh, can a flat print uh, could give. So I think these are all useful. And I think, uh, again, they, they are uh, very interesting information. Uh, uh, that, I mean, when you... Thing. The more information you have, the more you can do, and uh, so I think it 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 will be useful. I, I I don't see in the the things that we have done how we would use except for style characterization, which I don't think is particularly useful. Uh, uh, but yes, I am aware of these, and I think it's it's very interesting. Interesting also is that uh, with uh, uh, with lasers, uh, people are. Uh, interested are, are able to get information in layers within the painting and that has has been doing that to analyze uh, use of pigments in, 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 in paintings at different levels uh, so what I what I, as uh, uh, as people become more what digital methods can do and formulate questions that uh, mathematicians and engineers and physicists can help with are useful uh, to the art historians and that are interesting challenges to us technically. So. Thank you. Thank you again. I think uh, we can uh, finish here. So thank you very much. The people online. Uh, uh, okay, so thank you and see you uh, next time. <laughs> In person. In person. Yes, I, hope I, I, I hope I I I hope I will be to Rome again in the not too distant. Yeah, yeah, and there are a lot of paintings waiting for you here. And so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay, goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.